How's it going, guys? Welcome back to Topher Pro, where today we are reviewing the recently released horror game, The Callisto Protocol. This is going to be a spoiler-free review of the game, so feel free to watch if you're still considering buying the game, or maybe reconsider, because I only kinda liked the game. That's the review. I only kinda liked the game. Callisto Protocol is the first game under the development team Striking Distance Studios and directed by Glenn Schofield, most notably the executive producer of the highly acclaimed Dead Space series, of which this game aims to be a spiritual successor to, or maybe an attempt at a Dead Space killer? Either way, I'm going to be comparing this game a lot, a lot, to Schofield's first major horror success. As with Visceral Games' past entries, the atmosphere is top-notch. Rooms and areas are packed to the brim with little details, dodgy lights, rattling pipes, echoing corridors that keep you on your toes. The world as a whole is grimier, more deteriorated than their last sci-fi outing. And the fact that the story progresses you through different facilities of Callisto, the prison, oxidation dome, the mine shafts below, makes it feel like a real, functioning world, much like we've seen before on the Ishimura from Dead Space 1. If it's anything that Skullfield's team excels in, it's the world building and structure to the level layout. Granted, without a viewable map to show you where you've been or where you're heading, you can accidentally wind up in a cutscene that renders past rooms inaccessible if you weren't done exploring, but still I think it's rare to see this level of detail in games anymore. The visuals are a bit of a mixed bag. Locales can be absolutely breathtaking, and an excruciating amount of time was put into getting a perfect recreation of Josh Duham... J Duha what the fuck is this guy's name? Damel? Alright. A perfect recreation of Josh Damel into the game, from facial expressions to beads of sweat perpetually dripping down his gorgeous face. On the other, much more noticeable hand, is the way the game looks and handles like a walking speech impediment. Pre-patch, the game would nosedive into abysmal frame drops during cutscenes or if too much activity was happening on screen. Even after several patches, the game will have a hard time maintaining its 30 frames per second with just one enemy encounter, and smaller things like pop-in, items disappearing, animations not playing through, low-res textures, frequent crashes, alright, that one's not so small, and whatever this is. While the game has plenty of details in its levels, there's a pretty severe lack of polish in its presentation. In an effort to separate themselves from the Dead Space series, the gameplay takes a turn from an emphasis on gunplay and focuses more on melee combat. The stun baton becomes your trusty weapon while you collect schematics to purchase guns as you progress through the world. Further along, you'll find this game's version of the Kinesis module, the Grip Glove, which can grab whole enemies instead of simply body parts or items scattered across rooms. Though the game's intro is slow to get you into the foray with just a rusty steel crowbar for melee, as more weapons and enemies are introduced, it begins to open itself up to more weapon and gameplay combinations. You can grip enemies into hazard traps, lock onto enemies after a melee combo for a quick gun tap, and even stealth kill in certain situations to reserve your ammo and grip battery. The weapons themselves aren't anything special. The stun baton and skunk gun are pretty fun standouts, especially the baton seeing as it's their attempt at this game's iconic weapon for players to attach to, and the idea that the one-handed and two-handed weapons are interchangeable on a single grip is an interesting futuristic take, but all in all it's simply a pretty standard loadout of shotguns, pistols, and assault rifle. The upgrade system is pretty standard fare at this point. Find credits in rooms or on killed enemies, optionally sell items in your inventory, and then purchase upgrades and equipment with said credits. Every gun has the same layout of upgrades in the form of enhanced ammo capacity, damage, and stability, but all end in a Versace expensive, very powerful alternative fire that eats through more ammo but deals insane damage in creative ways. Aside from the guns, you can also upgrade your baton and grip glove to improve their efficacy, so amongst your options, there is a certain degree of tailoring the campaign to your playstyle. Do you want to sink your points into guns and hope to keep enemies out of arm's length with firepower? Or do you feel confident in your abilities with a stun baton and use long-range weapons as a last resort? But the absolute crown jewel of this game, and if you know, you know. The HUD. The heads-up display. There is none. Everything information-based is fed to you via holograms functioning within the world. Your health and grip battery is displayed by the bars on your neck, Ammo counter only pops up when you aim your weapon, and the inventory and bio menus are only accessible in-game, which means you need to be aware of your surroundings before you go to pop a health injector or check a new audio log you've collected. It is clean, immersive, and just as slick as the day the UI popped out of the Dead Space womb over a decade ago. Unfortunately, with all these elements in place, it's still held back extensively by this sweet little tutorial page. Dodging in melee is not timed. What the fuck? 
Meaning, you can just hold the joystick or mouse in one direction, and no matter how long you've had it held, as soon as an enemy strikes, you will automatically dodge it. Imagine if in Dark Souls, you just held up your shield, and after being attacked, it gave you a parry window to hit back. Some enemies will strike several times in a row, but all that means is switching the direction of the joystick to the opposite side before the next attack. This makes the first half of the game totally fucking brainless. These fucking Coco Melon ass combat mechanics. And while this is alleviated with later enemy types that force you to stay on the move, your character is built like a tank and moves like one too. It's really sluggish to maneuver during combat even while you hold the sprint button, and if an enemy has initiated an attack, no matter what distance you clear between you two, they will gravitate towards you and connect since you were attempting to run, not block. It becomes abundantly clear in later sections that the game was meant for multi-enemy encounters, but the mechanics are designed around one-on-one -on -one confrontations. The way combat works is that once you've locked onto an enemy, you're basically entangled with them until a melee combo is finished or if you disengage to back out. If another enemy is present, they can still swing at you in the middle of a combo on a separate enemy, and because you can't just switch locking onto a different enemy at a time, you're just taking free hits to the dick until one person is dispatched, at which point you can then focus them. On top of that, a game mechanic later in the game that evolves the monsters in front of you seems novel on the surface, but ultimately turns enemies into damage sponges that elongates encounters far beyond the point of enjoyment. If an enemy starts evolving and then someone else comes in, now you either have to fight the new guy and watch the other turn into a ball sack with claws, or try to work around the new guy and stop the evolution. Ultimately, once you reach sections with three or more enemies at a time, combat will feel less like an intense battle that you're trying to determine how best to beat the odds, and more like a game of I Spy to find the trap hazards to try and grip enemies into for an insta-kill. Because when you're given a hammer, everything in the game just looks like a nail. Also, do not steal that gameplay trick, that is a Tover Pro tip, TM. It belongs to me, I will see you in court, and I will most likely lose, intellectual property is not my strong s Aside from everything else, the story is pretty decent and has a good pace of peeling back the mystery behind the prison. You play as Jacob Lee, a cargo pilot who's attacked by an interstellar terrorist group, crash landing on Jupiter's moon Callisto, and inexplicably detained by the senior officer. He explains that the call is out of his hands, that this is your new home, Every other Thursday is Taco Thursday, and before you can chime in, isn't it Taco Tuesday? Attention. All security personnel, report to the main cell block. This is not a drill. So, what does this mean about Taco Thursday? With the help of some unlikely allies, Jacob slowly unravels the secrets of Black Iron Prison in a desperate attempt to get off the moon Callisto. It's the tried and true narrative of, get to this thing, fix it, now the next thing in your path needs repairing. And it works well enough, although it means, once again, they have a pretty bland protagonist on their hands who just does what he's told without giving it a second thought. Jacob never truly feels like he has a personality of his own or is ever in charge of the situation at hand. It's reminiscent of Isaac Clarke on the Ishimura, just an engineer being the only one who can fix the facilities on board to get them back home. But at least with Isaac, he has a clear motivation for his participation in the story that culminates in a gut-wrenching conclusion. Here? Uh, Jacob is thrust into the world of Callisto, and his motivation is pretty muddy up until the end of the game. And even then, I feel like most, if not all, of the character relations that are built up over the game are forced over the course of a few short hours. We don't have enough time to care about a co-pilot, we hardly spend time between prison inmates, and with a flick of a switch, enemies become friends. Perhaps... lovers? For all of the locales that you'll come across, there's never that moment that takes your breath away or is the thing that you talk to your friends about the next day. Bro, did you get to the daycare? Holy shit, that part was fucking nuts. Oh man, the cathedral area with the hunters freaked me out. The orbital the drug you There's nothing that really comes close to the iconic places or set pieces of their previous works. Like yeah, the prison outbreak is pretty cool, but then you've got water control, oxidation, Callisto's surface, the hangar, the prison's lower levels. Like, the levels are distinctive and technically incredible to look at, 
but there's no moment that makes you look back on it fondly. The only one that truly stands out is the fall from Black Iron Prison, and that's because they copy-pasted it from the orbital drop from Dead Space 2. I mean, if it ain't broke, right? The performances are pretty solid, nothing outstanding, but for actors with little experience in the game industry, Josh Demel is committed to the role and Karen Fukuhara works well off of him. The oddest inclusion here, though, is Sam Witwer. Not because of a lack of experience in the game industry. No, the dude's been pretty prolific over the years. I don't know if it's the script. I don't know if it's the direction, or if it's purely the way he chooses to deliver the lines. But between this and Days Gone, the dude is a strange fit. Unhinged corrections captain whose lust for power is so great he deems the prison his kingdom? Yeah, match made in heaven for this fucking lunatic. What do you think now, huh? Somebody shoots back, how do you like that? But the over-the-top lines, sometimes misplaced emphasis, and overall goofiness doesn't really mix in with this super serious narrative. And while having an air of mystery is fun to keep the player following the trail of breadcrumbs, too much mystery without payoff is just going to leave players frustrated. There's an achievement for discovering the secret chambers within Black Iron Pr That's not a spoiler. A game with aliens, shady leaders trying to suppress the discovery, and the theme of evolution is always going to have cult shit behind the scenes. The achievement states, uncover the mystery of Calipolis. What mystery? There are two audio logs with cult members going, uh, uh, yeah, uh, cult stuff, yeah, meeting adjourned, and nothing of significance is discovered. You have to drip feed something, otherwise this is just a mystery box narrative written by J.J. Abrams for someone else to pick up the pieces after. And probably the most upsetting thing in a horror title is it's just not scary. Knowing that a majority of enemies have to engage with you mano a mano means that the tension in the room is sucked out when a guy starts charging you like the company holiday party drunk. You get in my face with that, I'll beat your goddamn ass, you son of a bitch! All of the tricks you've become used to in the Dead Space franchise are front and center here, and it's just really paint by the numbers. You can see certain stuff coming a mile away, crawling through vents you know you're safe because vent sections always are, and sometimes audio cues will play before an enemy has appeared. Plus, if you miss the window of opportunity to stop a monster from evolving into a damaged sponge brute, you're more fed up than terrified by that point. Don't get me wrong, the horror mechanics are here, like everything is set in place. A monster popping into frame before ducking into a ventilation shaft, shadows crawling on the wall, fog dispersing down a long hallway, scratching and clawing moving from one end of the room to the next. But this is like Mike Wazowski in Monster U, not Ink, U, where you have to set up the scares before you can go in for the kill. Except with all of the tension and setup in the world, at the edge of the bed is Mike Wazowski. It's just linear horror going through the motions, and I wish there was something that could have shaken up the formula. Overall, the story ends on a pretty satisfying note, even if the final boss fight is a major let down with everything leading up to it. There's some level of resolution, and the ending leaves room for a sequel? Or at the very least, some manner of epilogue that could show up in the season pass? Oh no. But, you know what? I'm probably gonna end up buying it. Because for all of its flaws, I still enjoyed my time with Callisto Protocol. There's some fun to be had with the collection of weapons at your disposal, and the atmosphere for the world is unmatched. If I can get Jacob Lee to be a bit more nimble, have some level design that calls for more than the use of one type of gun or equipment, and a little more enemy variety, then I think they're gonna have something special in their hands. Keep it up. But also, Glenn, don't brag about your development team being under crunch conditions at work. It's fucking weird. All said and done, I'd give this game a 6 out of 10. However, upgrading the baton's damage does change the electrical current's color. Fuck it, 6.5. Hey, thanks for checking out this review. If you like this, be sure to check out the rest of the channel, and you can expect more video game reviews in the future. Plus, I do have a Twitch channel where I stream a variety of games, Callisto included. So hop on over to twitch.tv slash Toverpro and give me a follow for random scheduled streaming. I'd appreciate it. You guys have a good day, and a happy new year. Take care.